this semester, so um, we have to go fast. And some of you um, are going to need additional help to keep up, so make sure you come in the morning if there's something that you're confused about, because I have to go fast. All right, voting and voting behavior. In 1787, our founding fathers, men in Philadelphia, to create a new constitution. They wrote uh, the constitution during the Constitutional Convention. And they decided that voting eligibility and voting rights will belong to who? Man, who's going to decide who can vote in a state? The state. The state. The state will decide. That's one of their reserved powers that are reserved to them under which amendment? The 10th. The 10th amendment of the United States. So the framers chose to leave voting requirements rights to states. The states are, the, are the, going to be the ones to decide who can vote and who cannot vote in their particular state. And as a result, many of these states decided to deny women, deny African American rights. And they bestowed voting rights only to land owning white men for what? But as the American history progresses, we're going to see that our elections are going to be more and more democratic. It used to be in 1787 that only white men who owned property were able to vote, but states are going to open themselves up more and more and amendments are going to be added to the Constitution, laws are going to be passed by Congress that are going to expand the voting population of the United States. Oh, so, however, numerous amendments and legislation, what are amendments again? Changes, Changes to the Constitution. the Constitution, additions to the Constitution. Who makes legislation? Congress. Congress, Congress makes amendments. legislation. Numerous amendments and numerous legislation are going to make our system more democratic. The first one happened after the Civil War with the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, one of the Reconstruction Amendments. It gave us or extended voting rights to all what? Points. All men. To all males. So universal male suffrage in the United States. That's a word I don't hear much of. Or a phrase. Male. Male suffrage. Universal male suffrage. Anybody, doesn't matter if you are black or white, you are now able to vote as long as you have a penis and as long as you're on the voting age. Let's, let's end the male suffrage, boys. All right. 17th Amendment. We talked about a lot in this class. You should know what it is. Black. <laughs> it's women. In the, in the Senate, it used to be. How many senators does each state have? Oh, two. two senators. Those senators were not elected by the people. They According to the Constitution, Article 1, they were chosen by the state legislatures or the state governments. Um, again, this is part of our founding fathers' desire to preserve our government for who? Elites. For the elite. Like not letting people have that choice, not letting the mob choose who's going to represent us in the Senate. Letting the state legislatures do it all, do it because they're more qualified um, to do it. But then the 17th Amendment was added to the Constitution, and that allowed people to directly elect their senators. Make sure you remember the 17th Amendment. Very popular question on your test. Direct popular elections of senators. That's what happened a couple of weeks ago when we elected Ted Cruz again to represent us in the Senate. Dang it. Yeah, I was, I was really pulling for Neil Dykeman. So remember that our constitution, the original constitution, our founding fathers did not mean to us to have that control over the Senate, that direct control over the Senate. Um, they wanted the state legislatures to choose who's going to be the senators. So what kind of democratic theory is that? You have three? Elite. Elite. Elite, elite. elite theory. That is elite theory. So what's the answer for the moment? Sorry? Oops. I put that away. And then this one, the best one of all, women's suffrage. You see your dad is sexting? <laughs> oh, my dad is sexting. <laughs> oh, okay. <I> was... <laughs> yeah. uh, women's suffrage. 19th Amendment is women's suffrage. It doubled the uh, voting population of the United States. Congrats, women. Proud of you guys. Woo. But again, that was in the 1920s, way after African Americans got the right to vote. It's 50 years exactly. All right. So although minorities and women got their rights to vote with the 15th and 19th Amendments, states still have the power for voting eligibility. States can still decide the requirements. Even though they cannot take away that right anymore, what can they do? They can institute poll taxes. They can make it harder. Like instituting poll taxes. What else Literacy makes it harder tests. for people to vote? Literacy tests, the constitutional test, that grandfather clause that we talked about in this class. Mm -hmm. It made it harder for people, even though they have the right to vote, it made it harder for them to exercise that right to vote. So, Many states sought to suppress minority and women votes by making it more difficult for them to vote. 
They can't straight out say you cannot vote because you have the 15th and you have the 19th Amendment now, but they can sure as hell make it harder for them to vote. How literacy tests, government tests, poll taxes, stuff that we talked about in this class, and some tough stuff that we talked about with Mr. Luna. Oh, man. We're going to fix that. With the 24th Amendment, anybody remember what happened? Advanced poll taxes. Advanced poll taxes. So we took that away from the states by the, by the addition of the 24th Amendment. They can no longer implement poll taxes in the election rules. Doesn't like the Voting Act, voting act out there is. The next, agree. Congress passes another law called the Voting Rights Act of 1965. A year after the Civil Rights Act was passed, we passed the Voting Rights Act. It bans anything else that would make it harder for a minority to vote. It bans poll taxes, literacy tests, grandfather clauses, and all other forms of suppression, voter suppression tactics that would make it more difficult for a minority to exercise their right to vote. So third period, somebody asked me a question, which is, I got stumped by it. I always get stumped. But um, she asked me, is the Voting Rights Act of 1965 constitutional? Why isn't it constitutional? Why wouldn't it be constitutional? What would be the argument against the Voting Rights Act of 1965? Because the elections belong to who? The, the states. states. Elections are reserved for the states. This is who controlling elections? The federal government. The federal government. The federal government controlling elections in the United States. So the reasoning behind this is um, it's a law that enforces which amendment of the Constitution? Uh, the 15th. It enforces the 15th Amendment. Congress says we need some way to enforce the rights of black people to vote. That, uh, so we're using the 15th Amendment as justification to pass the this. the elastic clause, right? Yes. Does that make sense for everybody? Yeah. Actually, in 2013, the Supreme Court struck down some of, some of the Voting Rights Act of 1960. We'll see that later on. Oh my god. The 26th Amendment? Um, a lot of the states back then, they did not allow people who are 18 to 20 to vote. The age requirement was 21. The, the 26th Amendment will change that. It will extend voting rights to people age 18 to 20. Now, if you're 18 years old, you are now able to vote in the United States. So, as you can see, as U.S. history progresses, more and more people in the United States can vote. But today, even though more of our population have that ability, they have the right to be able to vote. Our voter turnouts are very, very low compared to turnouts in other countries. Tell me the main reason why. Well, I, know, I know like Australia, it's compulsory to like vote. In some countries, you have your compulsory, your man, it's mandatory to vote. Not, not in the United States. States, states, people make can make it very states can make it very difficult to vote. There's one state requirement that made the clarity. Voter ID. Voter ID. Uh, not that one. No. So in the United States, in all 50 states in the Union, before you're able to vote, there's one requirement. What's that requirement? U.S. citizen. You need to be a U.S. citizen. That also suppresses voter oh, turnout. driver's license. You need to what? You don't have to have a driver's license. No. You need to, you need to register. Oh, register. Oh. If you're not registered to vote, you're not able to vote. So in Texas, you can't just show up during voting day and, and vote. You need to register beforehand. And that makes it inconvenient for a lot of people, especially poor people in the United States, to exercise their right to vote. Because it does take time out of your day to go ahead and register. For some people, it's not a big deal. For a lot of people, it is. It makes it inconvenient. In some, in some countries, you show up during voting day, you go vote. There's no can registration required. Can you register online? In some states. Some states, like ours, you cannot. You can't? It depends on the state. So. More Man, why does Texas hate Go ahead and put voter get. registration here. Voter registration. Yeah, you can serve states on you. Yeah. Conservative states make it harder to register. Why? Because it makes it very difficult and very inconvenient for some to vote. Voter registration is an inconvenience that some cannot get over. Some people don't want to vote anyway, and then having them to register beforehand, that's something that a lot of people can't get pass. Each state has their own way to register voters. Some states have very um, strict voting requirements, which would lower voter turnout. States like ours, we have very strict voting requirements in the state, which lowers voter turnout in Texas. 
In some states, it's easy to register, it's easy to vote. Texas is not. So something that does make it easier to vote is a law passed by Congress called the Motor Voter Act of 1993. What it does is it makes it more convenient to register. So this, is per this pertains to a lot of you. A lot of you are about to get your driver's license or have gotten your driver's license already. What the motor voter law allows you to do, it forces the states to allow you to register to vote while you're getting your what? While you're getting your driver's license. There's a, a little check mark while you're registering to, for your driver's license. There's a little check mark in there that says, do you want to be registered to vote? To check it, congratulations, you're already registered to vote. So you can do this when you're applying for a driver's license and when you are renewing your driver's license. So those of you about to renew or about to apply, don't forget to take that little box. It makes it more convenient. It's easier to register to vote because of this particular law. And this is across all the states of the United States. States are forced to allow this to happen. Even though some states might not want to, this is forced. So it makes it easier to vote, voters to register to vote by requiring states to allow citizens to register when applying or renewing their driver's license. Is anybody confused about the Motor Voter Act? Does it increase or decrease voter turnout? It increase. It would increase it because it makes it more convenient to do what? To vote. I mean, not to, register, to vote, register, register. To register. All right, voter turnout. States and their laws, remember they can control elections, they have influenced voter turnout in the United States by the laws that they pass. But it's very different for each state. Some states make it easier for pe their people to vote. Some states make it more difficult for their people to vote. So some state, law, uh, some state laws create structural barriers. Structural barriers. That would make it more difficult for someone who is eligible to vote to exercise his right to vote. Some states make it easier, while others seek to make voting easier. It just depends on the state that you live in. All right, so somebody in this class already brought up photo ID requirements. Some states require photo ID before you register or before you vote. Again, why does that lower voter turnout? So you have to some, people don't have ID. some people don't have IDs. You probably know a grandma that got her driver's license taken away. You might know somebody <laughs> who got a DUI, got their driver's license taken away. Um, but a lot of people argue that photo ID laws are not a big deal. Um, you can get a free one if you go to a government office. You can always get a free one. But again, it makes it get, it adds a step to the process and makes it more inconvenient for people. So, it requires voters to present some form of photo identification. If you look at the graph or the map on the board, Texas has one of the strictest photo ID laws in the United States. It's very hard to acquire a photo ID that's going to be um, presentable when you're voting in Texas compared to other states. Some states don't even require photo IDs like the states in gray. What's the reason for photo ID laws, or what's the reason that photo ID law proponents suggest that we need photo ID? Laws? You don't have people voting twice. You don't right? have people impersonating somebody. Voter fraud, voter impersonation will be curtailed because of photo ID laws. There's a problem with that. It's not supported by facts. In the United States, we have very few cases of voter impersonation in the US of people voting for someone else or voting for the dead. That doesn't usually happen. And when it does happen, it's so little that it doesn't affect any elections. It doesn't affect any outcome of any elections. It is estimated that millions and millions of dollars are going to be spent because of these photo ID laws. So what's the real reason for photo ID laws? Mm -hmm. Real reason for photo ID laws. Suppressing the vote. Suppressing the vote. Why do we want to suppress the vote? Look at where the photo ID laws are in that map. Who's going to be less likely to have a photo ID? The minorities. Are minorities poor. and poor people are less likely to have a photo ID. In Texas alone, uh, black people are three times less likely to have a photo ID than white people. Hispanics are twice less likely to have a photo ID than white people do. What can you tell me about the states that have a lot of these photo ID laws? They're more, uh, conservative. They're more conservative, the Republican states. And who do Republicans have a hard time getting to vote for them? Minorities, college students, and those people are going to be less likely to have a what? ID. What do I need? They're not going to vote for us? Might as well make it more difficult for them to vote, which increases whose chances in the elections? The Republican Party's chances during elections. Does this make sense for people? It is estimated in Texas because of photo ID laws, which doesn't help anything because voter fraud isn't really a thing in the United States. 
it would dis disenfranchise about 300,000 more voters in Texas. It's a lot. So it requires voters to present some form of photo ID. Does it increase or lower voter turnout? Lower. It lowers voter turnout. Makes it more inconvenient. And again, I don't want to harp on the Republicans too much. The Democrats, if they can get away with it, they would do the same thing. And again, the Republican reasoning for this is it's easy to get a photo ID. It's not that inconvenient. All right, same day registration. It's exactly what it says. Um, in some states, they allow same day registration, which means you can do what at the same time? You vote and register. You can register and vote on the same day. You can just show up, register, and then vote on the same day. Unlike here in Texas, we don't have same day registration. You have to register a certain amount, uh, a, a specific amount of time, and then you need to go ahead and vote on the next day. So this just makes it more convenient for people. Would this lower or make voter turnout higher? Make it higher. higher. Make it higher. This would increase voter Look turnout. That. Look at Maine. So it allows Maine. voters to register on election day. On election day. This is what most countries have, by the way. We don't have this in the in Texas. Online registration, we talked about this already, allows voters to register online. Increase voter turnout or decrease? Increase. It increase it because it makes it less, con uh, more convenient to register. And again, Texas doesn't have it. Most states do. And uh, I'm imagining... Is that saying North Dakota doesn't have registration at all? Where? Pink doesn't have registration. North Dakota. It does not have registration. It should have registration. What? I'll have to look that up. <laughs> Do but they really have enough people anyway to influence any election. It doesn't really matter. And then two senators. All right. Early voting. Does Texas have early voting? Yes. Yes, we do. It allows voters to vote before the actual election it increases. Day. Does it increase or decrease voter turnout? Increasing. Why would you want to vote beforehand, before election day? So you would like. You can, so you, you can go to work on election day and go You can home. go to work on election day. Maybe it's a more convenient time for you right. to um, take time before election day. What else? You get to skip the what? Skip the polls. You get to skip the lines, you get to skip the traffic. So I recommend if you are going to vote someday, take advantage of Texas's vote of early voting because it, it is more convenient. So it allows voters to vote before election day. Mail-in votes. And then mail-in voting. I don't know if Texas has We do have it because in Hidalgo County there's a lady who got is it arrested. Is it registration voting? No. Mail-in registration mail -in. or is it mail-in voting? Mail-in voting. So it allows voters to mail their votes in. Increase voter turnout or decrease it? Increase. Increase it. Because you don't have convenient. to take time out of your day. It's more convenient. Um, yeah, North Dakota doesn't have voter registration. That's weird. Yeah, it's the only state without voter registration. All right. Did you use your phone with that? Yes. Oh. Next. Laws about felons voting. States are different. Um, some states don't allow their prisoners to vote. And some, states some states don't allow ex felons to vote. Exactly. That's in crazy. some states, even if you did your time already and you serve society and you paid what's owed, e even if you get out of prison, some states are not going to allow you to vote for the rest of your life. Or they're going to have a uh, moratorium years before you can go ahead and vote. So well, states that are in black. Even California doesn't allow parolees to vote. I guess that's insane. So many states prohibit their felons from voting. Maine has no restriction. The inmates get to vote in Maine. Yes. <laughs> That's dope. In most European countries, this is the case. I think in Norway, um, prisoners vote first. Mm -hmm. So they actually have presidential debates inside of prisons. That's not because their vote, their vote counts. But in the United States, States, most of the felons, their votes don't count. Which is a shame because most of the people that are in prison disproportionately are what? Minorities. There are minorities. Af That's uh, African Americans and Hispanics. Sure, we can pretend that the Voting Rights Act solve all our problems when it comes to discrimination in the voting but booth. Really? But that's not really the case. Voter ID laws and those felon laws um, still keep um, minority voting down in the United States. So these voter registration laws and procedures are determined um, at the state level and therefore vary a great deal between states. It's different, some states it's easier, some states it's harder. Many of these state voting procedures disproportionately disenfranchises who? Minorities. Minorities and the poor. 
Which party would get hurt by these laws? The Democrats. 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 The Democrats. Because minorities tend to vote for them, the poor people tend to vote for them. So this negatively affects Democratic votes. What was the V there for? Very. It's different for each state. Again, it depends on the state. We have federalism in this country. They do control elections. God bless you. All right. During the national level election, there's two types. There's a presidential election happens every how many years? Four. Every four years. What's the last one? Uh, 2016. 2016. 2016. What's the next one? 2020. 2020. 2020. Or you can choose to keep Donald Trump or maybe choose a Democratic candidate. Hillary Clinton, let's go be. In between presidential elections, in the middle of a presidential there's term, there's a midterm. It's called a midterm election. Oh my God. During a presidential election, who can we vote for? Congress. I mean, for the president. President. The vice president. President, vice president. Uh, your senator. Not, all, not only that, but you can also vote for some members of Congress. Yes. So some like, senators. The House is up again. House of Representatives. Everybody, yeah. all the seats in the House of Representatives is always up every two years. Remember, how long do they serve? Two years. Two, two years. years. So every two years, House of Representative members are up for Some members of the Senate. And a third of the Senate. And then it's up for grabs. your governor, right? Sometimes Some governors. And then when it comes to midterms, who do we get to elect? Two thirds of the Senate. One third of the Senate. One third of the Senate. And the whole of the what? The, the whole House. 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 What's the difference between a presidential election and a midterm? Midterms, you're not voting for the president. You're right? not voting for the president, right? Yeah. You can vote for some members of the Senate and all of the House of Representative members. Sure so the turnout's lower in the midterm. Which one gets more voter turnout, obviously? L lower in the midterm. President. Presidential or mid midterms? Presidential. Presidential. They get more voter turnout. Even though this is the one that gets the most um, out of all the elections that we have, the state level, the local level, presidential elections get the most, we are lucky to get 55%. Do this show up, but which is kind of bad. Wait, wasn't this midterm like super high turnout? Yes. Because of bit. All right. So if you look at if you compare presidential election turnout with midterm turnout, obviously midterm like see 10, 10 less turnout than presidential election. Why? Because it's not as exciting. You're not voting for not as exciting. No. Don't, don't put you in the roller coaster to vote for a presidential election. People don't see it like it's worth it. It's not like, worth it. Like they think like presidents more important. They think that the presidency is more important. The presidential office is at stake. A lot of people in the United States, they exaggerate the power of the president. Mm -hmm. um, the president does matter, but these members of Congress also do matter also. So I'll tell your story. Senate lives matter. Baby. And this messed up the Democrats a long time ago. In 2008, we see huge turnouts for Democrats. And that allowed who to win by a landslide? Obama. Obama. Allowed Obama to win by a landslide. And it allowed the Democrats to control the House of Representatives and the, the Senate. Senate. They even had a supermajority in the Senate, which means they had, they had 60 votes, which means they can get past a what? A filibuster. A filibuster. Oh my gosh. There was nothing stopping the Democrats at all. Not Socialism. even a filibuster. Socialism. But then, in the midterms in 2010, the Democrats forgot to show up. And what ends up happening? They lost the Senate. The Republicans Senate. took control of the House. The Republicans took control of the Senate. And the rest of President Obama's career was a nightmare for him because he had a lot of checks on the Republicans in Congress. Oh, poor B. <laughs> so midterms are important. So midterms, the congressional elections that occur uh, in even numbered years between presidential elections. Presidential election, the election takes place every four years in which voters elect the president and some members of Congress. So shall we go. Typically presidential elections. So typically presidential elections see more voter turnout, more people show up, about 52, 53% around there of eligible voters. I think in India, they have like 80 something percent show up. People see this election as more what? Important. It's more important because the presidency is at stake. Why is voter turnout in America so low? More minority. We don't care. Presidential elections also get more minority media, no, media. and public attention. <laughs> that's that's a very American thing to say. We don't care. Sorry? Presidential elections. They see more voter turnout. Alright. Everybody good so far? Yes. Two terms you need to know for today. 
political efficacy and political engagement. We talked about efficacy before. The belief that participation what? Matters. Will make a difference, will matter. So that your vote will affect the policies that government makes. The higher your sense of political efficacy, the more likely you are to do what? To vote. Uh, the more likely you are to vote. Yes. Do you think we'll see a huge spike in the presidential election? Probably. It always will. The belief that one's political participation can affect government policies. The higher your um, political efficacy is, the more likely you are to, to participate and vote. Political engagement is how interested you are in politics. In interest in politics. So right now, I can see a lot of you in this class are interested in politics, so those people are more likely to exercise the right to vote. Those of you that are just getting an A, less likely to vote because you're not that interested or not that involved in political activity. Everybody good? I'm just All right. So I went out there protesting for Beto. What are you talking about? I, I would have voted. Political scientists have measured data through polling, and they have concluded that there are some demographic groups that are associated with either high political efficacy or low political e efficacy or high political engagement or low political engagement. So we've seen trends. Some groups are more politically active, are more politically engaged, some groups are not. So that's something that you need to remember for your tests. When we are measuring or we're predicting who's going to win an election, it's not enough to figure out um, if a group is more likely to vote for someone or less likely to vote for someone. What actually matters is whether or not that group is will what? Show up. It will show up. So we've seen trends through data of groups that are more likely to show up or less likely. Let's look at this first one. This compares voter turnout by gender. Don't worry about the first one. This is overall. But as you go, the younger people, younger males and females, who's more likely to vote? Young females. Females. Wow. So from ages 18 to about 64, on, females are more likely to vote. But Why? Then, we know they're more politically engaged, they're more politically, they're, they have a high sense of political efficacy. Why? It's because women are smarter. Mark was right. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Why? Why? Why are women it's because they like, just got the right to vote. They got to use it, man. <laughs> Especially in the early in the early periods of their lives, women are more politically active than men. Why? Why does it matter to them more? So women are still fighting for their rights, right? So a lot of them think that this matters for them. Uh, what uh, what issues matter to women? Abortion, women's rights issues matter to them, especially in the early years, so they're more politically active. So that's what we can see. But then, as you grow up, you get less active. You can't get pregnant anymore. Hey, wow. All right. Next, let's talk about educational attainment. Your education level, what can you see in the graph? Less than ninth grade. How, how can I get into that group? Sorry. <laughs> What well, can you see in the graph? The, the more educated you are, the more likely you are. The more educated you are, the more likely you are to what? It's because they're rich, right, man. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta the more engaged you are, the more political efficacy you have, the more likely you are to vote. Next, income level, what, do you, what can you see? The richer you are, the more richer you are, the more likely you are to participate. There's more at stake for you. You're more engaged. Your political efficacy is up. Your tax is Next one is voter turnout by ethnicity. Who votes the most in the United States by ethnicity? White people. White people. Votes. About 65 percent of white people vote. Represent. Um, the lowest ones are everybody else here except for Zane. Um, <laughs> Asians and Hispanics. Oh, look at y'all duking it out. <laughs> Somebody yeah, asked me why know. is this the case? I'm not sure for Hispanics or for Asians. Like we're really busy. Oh. Uh, we're, we're, always, we're always just giving them. What do you mean you don't vote for Hispanics? Yeah. Sorry. What do you I actually don't know why, why it's so low. <laughs> what is uh, again, the yeah. social economics, <laughs> education, and stuff like that. Yeah. Alright, so it's goes out. When it comes to race, who's most likely to vote? White, white, white people, people, minorities are less likely to vote. So the least likely to vote is Hispanic voters? Yes. Wow. By like 0.5%. But there's so many of them that it's actually a big game. It still matters, right? Yeah. There, are there not enough agents? It's so weird saying so, so many of them. Yeah, so of many. you people. There's so many of you. All right. Income level. High. High, low is less likely to vote. Sex, female, male. Sex is female, male. Religion is. 
The more secular. religious are more likely to vote, the less religious atheists like me are less likely to vote. Uh, than you're, atheist. you're, you're an atheist? I Geographic region? I thought you were <laughs> Geographic Midwest, more likely to vote, right? So when it comes to geographic regions, especially in presidential elections, um, we're not going to try to talk about actual regions of the United States, but states that are considered battleground states, where um, the Republican pres the candidate or the Democratic candidate have a chance of winning, yeah, so like Ohio Iowa. and Florida and Iowa, they see more voter turnout. Why? California? California is a big battleground, bro. That's no, not. <laughs> what? Because so, every election, you had like three elections in your lifetime. Yes. Um, no, every election, the, the media always talks about the same states. Ohio, Florida, Iowa, because the Democratic candidate and the Republican candidate have a chance. States. They're swing states. They can go either way. Right. But they don't talk about, talk about Texas. They don't Sometimes talk about Pennsylvania. Swing state. Sometimes Pennsylvania swing. Why? Because we're, we're solid. We're, solid, we're, solid, we're, we're considered we're safe states, right? Texas is Republican territory. We're always going to go for the Republican candidate, and, ca and California we is Democratic territory. What's well, sorry? We, have we are always going to go for the Republican candidate. We are going to be the change. So put battleground states over here, because in our states like ours, people feel like their vote don't matter. So vote what's vote. lower? Voter turnout. Voter turnout. What's, what's lower? Voter so turnout lower. Your vote doesn't matter. What is that? Political efficacy. Political efficacy is lower. Or turnout. I said political effigies. That's not okay. <laughs> All right, education level. High, high education high level are more likely to vote. High level. Low education level are less likely to vote. All right. When somebody, when a voter is considered who to vote for in the voting booth, they vote for libertarians. There's many right. things. There's many factors that are involved when it comes to voting. The most important factor, oh, later on, but one of the factors is political ideology. Give me the two main political ideologies in the United States. Republican, Democrat. Uh -uh. No, conservatives. <laughs> conservatives. Conservatives and liberals. And liberals. So voters tend to support candidates with the same ideology. I'm sorry, Mr. Matista. They still party. Don't smite me. This one, I want you to put a star on because this is the one that affects voters the most. This is what they consider the most. Party, party identification or party ID. If you're a Republican, you're going to vote what? Republican. You're going to vote Republican. Democrats vote Democrats. So voters tend to support candidates from the same party. Most of it is because of laziness. They don't want to evaluate the candidate's stances on individual issues. Instead, they vote for their team. Go team, go. Uh, characteristic of a candidate, some voters, they make the decision based on what they perceive the character of the, of the candidate would be. Um, his trustworthiness, his experience, sometimes, unfortunately, his appearance, um, they consider when it comes to voting. A lot of people didn't vote for Hillary Clinton in 2016 because they didn't consider her, her as trustworthy, uh, not because of her stances, I but because of her stances. I thought you considered her ugly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Dang. I think that's why a lot of people didn't vote for Ted Cruz during that time. <laughs> he has a very punchable face. Yeah, yeah. Probably. Ted Cruz is handsome, but that was right. Dang, Mr. Ortiz is on Antifa now, bro. Voters often choose to make their decision by evaluating the candidates. Um, reliability. A race. Liability, <laughs> trustworthiness, trustworthiness experience. experience, and even appearance. Dang. Good thing Donald Trump's really cute. Oh, sorry. Was, like, he sorry? Like, reliability. I like Cheetos. Yeah. Reliability. <laughs> sorry? The what ease experience. Say? No, like, I actually think and that's why their appearance. I think that's why John John McCain, like, if he was an anti-social Republican turnout, like, actually, because he's, he's just, like, Obama is, he looks too old. old. Well, he looks old, and he's just, like, he is old, right? He, he was, like, a prisoner of war, so he's, like, John he's, like, hunched over and stuff. Yeah. He's, he's not right. a strong with person. This is why a lot of candidates during election time, and you'll see this, mm -hmm. they tried really hard to make themselves look relatable to, to voters. There was a story about Hillary Clinton in 2016 as she went down south. Her accent change, and she that's adopted great. a more like southern accent. I don't know if she did it consciously or not, but that's something. It's about being relatable to people. That's why it was one of the reasons John McCain chose Sarah Palin because she's down to earth um, and more relatable to people, which doesn't really make sense to me. She's not. She's not all that down to earth. She's kind of stupid. She's folksy, <laughs> and that's what a lot of people like. Which doesn't make sense because she said she could see Russia from her house. You shouldn't be voting for someone 
that's just like you, because how many of you can run this country? I can't I run can. this country. You should be yeah. voting for someone who's better than you. Marco, Marco and I can definitely run this country. All right, contemporary political issues, voters can make their decision based on the important issues that they're facing today. Today, the economy, gay marriage, abortion, those are very important issues, and some, whoa, whoa, whoa. some, some voters consider those issues, you consider those candidate stances like on that issue um, when they're selecting who's going, who are they gonna be voting for. So voters can make their voting decisions on major issues that the country is facing today, and the candidate stances. So would this make them like a single issue, issue voter? No, it doesn't necessarily have to be single issue, it could be multiple issue, but just the important ones of today. Like a depression doesn't matter anymore. And military spending, that's not on top of the list for most people. Like this upcoming election will probably be immigration. Immigration, yes. All right. The candidate's religious beliefs are sometimes taken into account. There's some people in, in the US won't vote for an atheist whatsoever or a Muslim whatsoever because they disagree with their beliefs. Um, race, gender, those are all taken into factors by some voters. A lot of people didn't vote for Hillary Clinton just because she was a woman. Yeah. Evangelicals, example, evangelical Christians vote Republican most of the time. So a lot of these evangelical Christians had to swallow their pride and like vote for um, Donald Trump, who is a known adulterer, because Hillary Clinton supports abortion and supports gay marriage, and that's something against their values. No can do. All right. Of these factors, what is the strongest driver of all the uh, religion? Uh, out of all that we talked about, which is the strongest factor? Religion. Oh my God! Party, Party. Party identification. Party. Party identification is the strongest one. Forty percent of voters in the United States. That's all they consider when they're voting in the voting booth. The party identification of the candidate. But if you don't have a lot of loyalty, if you're an independent, then these other factors will become more important for you. Like some of you in this class probably are not deeply loyal to the Republicans or Democrats, then you can take these other to account. Sorry. All right. Let's talk about voter behavior. I'm loyal to the Socialist Party. <laughs> Political scientists have defined several mo models of voter behavior in an attempt to explain the different motivation of voters. I don't know. scientists have tried to analyze what motivates voters to vote for someone. And again, what they see, the number one factor is parties. Voters, the voters what? Party identification. Party identification. So party line voting is very common in the United States. Supporting a party that one identifies with. Uh, most important mo a motivator. Most important motivator. If, you're, if you belong to the Republican Party, you want to support the Republican candidates, and you, you want to vote for them during election time. Second one is rational choice voting. Anybody here in political science? No. No. Right. Or criminal justice? Oh yeah, that one? No. Anybody? All right, so did you come across this? No. All right, so this is a theory in psychology called rational choice theory. Uh, when pe they assume that people are logical beings. That might not be a good assumption, but that's the <laughs> assumption. People are logical beings. That whenever we're making a decision, we weigh the rewards versus the consequences. If a criminal is deciding whether or not to rob a bank, in his head, he's measuring the consequences with the rewards. And if the rewards outweigh the consequences, then he goes through with it. If it doesn't, then he doesn't. Same thing what happens when people are voting in the voting booth. They consider who? They consider. The consequences of they consider the consequences, candidate. they consider themselves, they consider what is going to be the, for my best interest. Which candidate, out of all these that I have, would be best for my interest? So if I was somebody who owns Amazon, for example, and I want to lower corporate taxes, it would probably be to my best interest to vote for a what? Republican, Republican or Democrat? Republican. A conservative Republican, right? If I was a college student, I don't know how to pay for my college tuition. It's probably a good idea for me, if I'm for my best interest, to vote for a what? A socialist. To a Democrat or a so for somebody from the Socialist Party. So voting based on what is perceived to be in the individual's best interests. What is going to be, what's going to benefit you the most as a person, as an individual. This is not necessarily considering the entire country. It's not a holistic evaluation. It's considering who? Yourself. Yourself. Well, the thing it's is, more if, if everyone does that, then we get a true representation of what the country exactly. wants. So. So, for example, if one business owner who is concerned about taxes, 
he might choose an economically conservative candidate because that would be to his best interests. All right, Mr. Bautista. Yes, sir. Did you hear about that company that's like based out of China that's Amazon, but Amazon for the whole world is like way bigger than Alibaba? Alibaba? Yeah. yeah. So retro retrospective voting and prospective voting are different. Retrospective voting is what I call it. It's how you're going to remember it. What have you done for me lately voting? Which means when you're going to a voting booth, you consider which party is currently in power. So for the last year or so, which party is in power in the national level? Well, well, the Republicans are. And then you think to yourself, is the country better off or is the country yes. worse off? Did they make good decisions or did they make bad decisions? Yes. If you feel that the country is well off, what do you do? You vote again. You reward the Republicans by what? Voting by more voting for them again. Another term. Now by giving them didn't... another term by extending Donald Trump or extending a Republican reign in office. Now if you didn't like if it, if you didn't like it, you vote them you're going to punish them by what? Voting. By voting the opposite by party. By voting for the other party. That doesn't always happen. Like Ted Cruz, Ted Cruz got back in, even though he kind of sucks. Does that make sense for people? Yes. You're looking backwards, you're evaluating the job that they did, and if you feel like they did a good job, you vote for them again. If they didn't do a good job for you, then you punish them by voting for the other candidate, for the other party. Make sense? Yes. yes. All right, so voting to decide whether the party or candidate in power should be reelected based on um, the recent past. The recent past. Looking backwards. Evaluating whether or not they did a good job or not. According to you, yes, sir. Do you think Ordo will be solid blue soon? I don't think so. You don't, you don't think so. Number four, pro prospective voting is the opposite. Instead of looking backwards, what do you do? Looking forward. Look forward. Yeah. So voting based on predictions of how a party or candidate will perform. What does the F stand the for? In the future. I believe the Democrats are going to do a good job, so I'm going to vote Democrat. Do you actually? Do you, do you actually do? All right. Are you trying to push the liberal agenda? I am. <laughs> <laughs> he's going he's gonna to show us his hammer and sickle soon. Uh, let's go ahead and practice a call on someone. Do we get five so, points? Look at the motivators. I, I am lifelong Democrat. Obama has won. Look, so, look at the motivators and then tell me which motivator is the voter considering okay. what he okay. thinks. So, the economy has been growing under. Clinton, so he, he has won. my vote. Whoa, she has she, my vote. She. He so, has my vote. Whoa, whoa, whoa. She votes Bill Clinton. <laughs> Who's that? All right. Oh my God. The adulterer? No, no, no. <laughs> so what kind of voting is this? Is this party line voting? Hold on. Retrospective, prospective, or is it um, rational choice voting? Matthew. Oh, choice back. Retrospective. You're looking at the recent past. So go ahead and write that down, please, so that you know the examples. All right, this one should be easy. I'm a lifelong Democrat, so Obama has my vote. Chris? Oh my God. What is this one? So you have four choices. So he says, I'm a lifelong Democrat, so I'm going to vote for Obama. Party line vote. He's considering his what? His party. His party identification. Alright, next, number three. Bush has ideas that will be really good for this country, so I'm going to vote for him. Alan? Mm -hmm. Prospect. Prospect. Because you're making a decision based on the what? The future. future. Based right, on is the that future. Jeb Bush? It doesn't matter. No, come on, man. It's probably George W. Bush. Trump's economic policies has not led to significant Wait, job growth, so I'm voting Democrat this election. So I'm talking about Marco, you see it? Retrospective. Retrospective. You don't believe that they're doing a good job, so you punish them. Number so retrospective five, means it's like a referendum on what's happening. Right? Exactly. Uh, number five, I believe that Bernie Sanders will work to reduce college tuition. The communists. For me and my fellow students, so he has my vote. Wants to answer. I don't want to touch communism. Don't make me. Go ahead, Emily. Oh, rational choice. Please. Rational choice. Yeah. You're considering what's for your best interests. Good job, Emily. So make sure you're writing this down, guys, so that you can get the examples. So one's voting behavior may not often fall into a single category. Oftentimes, voters are motivated by a combination of the factors. Same. 
What's the most prominent one Friday night? Party line, yes. Party line bowl. Alright, we have five minutes left. You don't have any homework tonight because you have homework tomorrow. Because you have an essay to do, remember? Wait, do we just have to do the outline? That is due tomorrow at 8 a.m. Sorry? We just have to do the outline. Right? All you have to do is fill in the boxes, and that is actually the essay. <laughs> Well, you have, you could if you want to, but I'm glad you fill in the format first. I wrote a four page right. essay. Because all you have to do in the real test is just put them together. Right? <laughs> you said the whole essay. I said the whole essay. Yeah, that's why. That's what I was saying. Wait, so we just we have to fill out the boxes and turn in the boxes. That's it. That's it for right now, yes. Oh, okay, for right now. What do you mean for right now? Let's, no, I mean the next step is just put them together, right? What? It's the same thing. Wait, so, but we don't have to the actual essay. Wait, so yes, what, when do we have to come here? Yeah. So we don't have to tell the, I mean, we don't have to write the essay, right? <laughs> Not yet. What you're doing is actually writing the essay. No, but That's all you need. Are, are we Where's the tutoring? Right? Sorry? Yeah. Are we going to have to do the boxes? Yes. Where's the tutoring? Sorry? Where's the tutoring?